So from an early age, many people said that I would grow up to build things. And I don't think it was the most likely outcome. Both my parents were nurses, and there really wasn't anyone around me building things. But it started with Legos. I used to take over entire rooms in the house, building villages with trees and castles and people carrying out all of the normal functions of a society. And then I grew a little bit older, and I could pick up a hammer. So I decided to take my skills outside. I built a tree fort with my dad, and then I constructed what would be my first green buildings, the only difference being that my bedrooms were carved out of the carefully pruned branches of old rhododendron bushes. And it was these many days spent outside where my love story with nature began. Do you remember the, the first time as a kid when you realized the value of nature in your life? But as I've grown older, I realize that we live in a society that rarely promotes us having any type of a relationship with nature. That we live in a society where the average child spends between four and seven minutes playing outside each day. And that according to the New York Times, by the age of eight, we'll spend seven and a half hours on an electronic device outside of school. It's amazing how much we've changed the way that we spend our time in just the past few decades. And I wonder, what's our future evolution going to look like? I mean, what if Pixar's Wally got it right? And this is us in a couple hundred years. So when I was 25, I set out to rekindle my relationship with nature, and I started a company that focuses on building integrated environmental technology. My goal has been to find ways that we can bring nature and other green tech into the buildings around us. This has ranged from rain screen siding systems that can protect a building from the elements with plants, to usable rooftops that can produce food, natural habitat, and open space for tenants. And since starting this company, Many people have asked me how I came up with the idea and why I'm so passionate about putting plants on walls and weird things like that. Well, I always go back to my love story with nature because it was there that I realized that nature is beautiful, that nature is sexy, that nature is the perfect lover because it can elicit astonishment, sometimes fear, for some, a sense of need. Nature fills our lungs with oxygen. It provides many cures for us, and if we spend time in nature, it will heal us faster. Studies even show that nature can cure us from a broken heart. Nature has an amazing ability to reduce our stress. It can help eliminate outside distractions and improve our focus. Nature is man's real best friend, man's confidant, and the greatest lover that the world has ever known. So while I believe that there's all these amazing benefits that come from being in nature, there's one benefit that I want to focus on today, because I believe that this benefit alone would be reason enough for us to bring nature into our buildings, particularly our workplaces. According to Maggie Jackson, the author of Distracted, the average American spends 28% of their day being distracted and then recovering from these distractions. <laughs> According to business research company Basics, these texts, celebrity tweets, friend requests, push notifications that are like an IV injecting us with the latest and greatest news cost the United States $650 billion every year. It's the equivalent of the entire economy of Switzerland that we're wasting here just because we're turning into goons. <laughs> so what if? What if by taking nature into our buildings, by creating a healthier place to be, that we could reduce some of these distractions from 28% to 25% or 20%? 20%, that would be the equivalent of adding over 4 million productive workers to the US today. I would hope that with that kind of gain in production, that our business leaders would think that nature is as beautiful and sexy as I do. So since we're on the topic of being beautiful and sexy, sounds kind of wrong, but... <laughs> well, architecture with function is important, so is architecture that is beautiful and inspiring. And on that note, I'd like to point out that if any one of you were to take a walk in the park and then close your eyes, bend over, and pick up the first thing that you put your hand on, and then go and design and build a building that looked just like what was in your hand, that you would be one of the best architects in the world. Don't believe me? Let's take a walk. Let's say that you're in my hometown of Seattle where, unfortunately, there's been some cuts to park spending, and let's face it, there's just not as many biophilic options as there used to be. You close your eyes, you bend over, and you pick up a handful of rocks. But it's not all bad, because even buildings that are designed to look like a handful of rocks can be beautiful 
as demonstrated by this famous library in Colombia. Now let's say that you're somewhere a little bit more exotic, somewhere tropical. You close your eyes, you bend over and you pick up a handful of seashells. Ah, well now you're Jorn Utzen, the world famous architect of the Sydney Opera House. And let's say that you're somewhere in the Far East, maybe China. You close your eyes, you bend over and you pick up a shoot of bamboo. Well, there in the palm of your hand would be inspiration for Taipei 101, one of the tallest buildings in the world. From Antonio Gaudi to Frank Lloyd Wright and Bjarke Ingels today, the unforgettable architects find ways to connect their buildings to nature. So that leaves the question, what are all the other architects doing? <laughs> well, for the most part, I think that they're designing and building boxes. Sometimes they change what the boxes are made out of, but the forgettable architect's buildings resemble prisons more than anything that you'll find when you take a walk in the park and close your eyes and pick up something. The forgettable architect's buildings protect and separate us from nature and do little to connect us to it. So it's my belief that we need nature in our lives, around us, to have a healthy future evolution, to not end up like the people in Wally. So if we all accept it, the only thing left to do is to make it accessible to everyone. But herein lies our greatest challenge. You see, today, really green buildings are being built at such a cost that even the world's wealthiest 1% have a difficult time building, living, and working in them. It's as if really green buildings have become the extensions of the egos of wealthy individuals trying to prove their worth to the world. They're being built for three, four, five hundred dollars a square foot, sometimes more, in the name of sustainability. Well, I can tell you, there is nothing that is sustainable about this at all if they cannot be accessible to the average person. So how do we overcome this? Well, I don't have all the answers, but I think that we have to start by looking at the way that we design and build green buildings today. See, in most cases, when somebody wants a building, they go out and they hire an architect, They'll come up with a design for six months, maybe a year, and then they'll bring on a builder to build it. It's a really simple process that's worked for so long because, for the most part, buildings have been simple structures. But that's really not the case anymore. Really green buildings are more like complex technological devices. And oftentimes, this core team, they don't have a lot of knowledge of how biophilic systems and renewable energy and automation and rainwater catchment and all these other systems that allow us to create buildings that are connected to nature they don't have a lot of knowledge of how these systems work. It'd be like trying to start a software company without software engineers, like you're missing a really key ingredient. <laughs> so the answer in my firm has been that everyone specializes in the systems. Once we have a project budget, we start with the systems because these systems are where our core values lie. And then we work our way out from there. This puts the people responsible for creating a building that is connected to nature at the infancy of the project. Here's an example of a building in Portland, Oregon that we have developed, designed, our building, and will maintain. The project will feature the largest demonstration of living walls in the Northwest, has an eco-roof, a street-side awning made out of solar panels. A cistern rises up 25 feet in the courtyard to capture rainwater and take care of all the plants. It'll be certified LEED Platinum, and we're building it for less than half of what most other LEED Platinum buildings are being built for by using this approach of starting with the systems and having complete control of the design-build process. So in closing, I just want to say that I have a dream. I have a dream that one day we will walk through our cities and that as we enter our buildings, we will be distracted for a split second, but not with technology or work or anything else, but that we will be distracted by our childhood memories of nature I have a dream that we will take a deep breath, smile, and carry on because we are healthy, because we are focused, because we are at home in nature. Thank you. <laughs>